Hello everyone and welcome! It's me Hawkeye G and I'm here with another video for you. This time I'm doing one covering the latest patch to Total War Warhammer 3. Patch 2.2 is a very significant one, bringing some of the long requested tweaks of the game, as well as a host of other changes, and many important fixes to all sorts of factions. I want to keep this video kind of brief, um, but I also want to talk a little in depth about the changes I'll be highlighting, so I won't be covering everything that's in the patch notes, thus the term highlights for this video, I want to instead give a little bit more background and detail to specific things that I think are more interesting or that I'm more knowledgeable about, instead of just reading them off the list line by line and not having anything to say about them. Since I'm someone who's more familiar with the order factions in the game, I'm going to highlight what I think are significant changes there, though I'm also going to talk first about some of the more general changes to the game as well. This of course includes things like the settlement battle frequency rework, among other things. So to begin, I'll discuss what I think are the most important changes that apply to the game as a whole, then I'll be working my way through the factions I'm most familiar with, which would mean the Dwarves, the Empire, the Lizardmen, the High Elves, Kislev, Cathay, and then maybe a little Skaven too. With all that being said, let's get started. So there's a lot of changes in this patch, I can't stress that enough, and if I don't cover something, I mean I definitely recommend you at least skim these once or twice, give it a once over for yourself. There's a lot of stuff even in this general gameplay section that's really important, um, but I'm not going to cover all of it, like I said, I just want to focus on the stuff that I think is important or that's relevant to me and the things that I know. To start, we're going to talk about this change. Settlement and deployed towers have had their damage reduced to be consistent with Warhammer 1 and 2. This one should be pretty nice and will function well as part of the overall changes they're making to settlement, siege, and field battle balance. This means that settlement battles where you have to attack won't be quite as punishing, though of course your own will be a little tougher to defend as well as a result. They definitely need to rebalance the auto-resolve value for these fights though, as some still don't seem to be working correctly, and that is something that they mention in the part at the end about looking forward. Another change I was actually surprised by, but I've really liked so far, when colonizing ruins, you now take a temporary vigor penalty instead of massive manpower loss. This is a pretty significant change, and it affects things on offense and defense for the player. I've often used ruins as bait for opponents to get them to colonize it while I ambush them somewhere far away. Then that way when they capture the settlement, they're really low on health and you're able to just win that fight easily. Um, it also used to be a good way to start a war with an enemy who's in the middle of one, right? As soon as they take some sort of settlement or occupy some ruins, you can initiate a war and take advantage of them there. Even after this update, you'll still have the advantage in battle when attacking somebody colonizing a ruins, but now it won't be quite as significant. On the other hand, it also means that you as the player can go and settle ruins a lot more confidently, and I think that's the more important part of this change. You won't be taking such a massive risk to your army unless you're playing something very melee infantry or cavalry focused, and you also won't get those mystery war declarations that tend to happen when you appear weak, since other factions tend to look at your overall strength rating. If it dips too low, you can be under threat, and so especially in the early game it made things really punishing. I think this is a good change. The next thing I think is important is the channeling and winds of magic replenishment changes. Uh, this one is worth checking because for any race you play that didn't previously have a channeling stance, they've now added one. So they've added some form of winds of magic replenishment to one stance or another for every one of the races which was lacking one prior. Of course, the exception would be the dwarfs, since they don't use magic in the first place, um, but this is a really nice change, especially with the other changes to Winds of Magic that they've implemented in Game 3 in general. It's, uh, it's a pretty important change, so it's really helpful in my opinion. The next global change I want to talk about is character experience changes that they've made, and this actually covers a few different things. First is that victory type is no longer used as part of the experience calculation. Rather than the experience from your win being calculated partly by the starting and ending balance of power, um, that kind of determines what your victory is, it's now the experience you get is now calculated entirely by the amount of kills that you get and the proportion, like the, um, the percentage of the army that is totally destroyed. So, as they say, killing 80% of their army is worth the same amount of experience no matter what victory type you receive for it, or even if you get a defeat for it. They've also given heroes increased experience for participating in battles. Should be really nice so that they don't level up as slowly, and we'll see there's some other tools for that as well. It's this new mentor skill that's really caught me off guard. I, I didn't expect this, and I think that this is actually kind of a cool change. All lords and all heroes in the game now have this skill. It's a skill which gives them experience sharing across the entire faction. So this means that once you get a lord to level 30, they can share their experience gains both with 
all other lords in the faction that are active and this gives an additional boost to the heroes in your army as well you can see that you know at 30 40 and 50 you can get different tiers of this ability so it can be really strong and if i'm reading this correctly it's all active lords so every other lord you have leading an army gains the experience share when it comes to heroes, it does specify that it's only between other active heroes of the same type. So, you know, mages, warrior priests, witch hunters, as empire examples, there's so many others, I'm not going to try to say them all out loud. It, it only shares experience between the same hero type. So it's definitely not as powerful on the heroes, but it's still a pretty interesting thing to have. Uh, I think it's really cool. It's a unique feature. It'll help bring heroes up to speed in the late game without having to chase lord or hero recruit rank global bonuses as much. Having a couple of high power lords will help just all the rest of your lords in the game level up at a better rate. Anytime you lose a hero or a lord through some sort of mishap, recovering them will be less and less punishing as the game progresses. And I think that that makes a lot of sense. It's, I don't know, I, f I like it for consistency's sake once we get later into games. So the next thing is settlement and garrison changes or the frequency of unwalled settlement battles. This is it. This is the big one. This is the change many people have been clamoring for for quite some time, uh, basically since the game released, and I think they nailed it. I also think there's a little bit of confusion or perhaps miscommunication or misunderstanding on this one. I've seen some people not correctly understand or not correctly analyze the changes, so I definitely want to clarify things. With no further delay, let's talk about what they are. Major settlements or capital settlements still retain their walled siege battles. The siege battles, those stay the same. Minor settlements are now field battles by default, as long as they don't have the garrison building. Minor settlements that do have the garrison building turn into unwalled settlement battles. So if I, I like to call them siege battles for capitals, settlement battles, and then field battles. And I think that this wording is definitely playing a role in what's confusing people, especially conflating some of the rules about when settlements did or didn't get walls with the old garrison building. So to hop back into game and to just show you directly, you can see here that it, there is no chance that this becomes an unwalled settlement battle. As soon as you build this level two garrison, it turns this settlement into a settlement battle instead of a field battle. The same thing is true at tier three. There is no chance it, it, in, i think they should have used the term ability you get the ability to turn things into settlement battles uh, it's it's a definite thing it's there's no chance about it so maybe part of that wording is unclear or maybe the original tier three garrison making them walled sieges instead of unwalled settlement battles is something that's tripping people up as well i guess although it's such a big change i don't actually have much more to say about it as i think the results are pretty straightforward I will say that I've enjoyed settlement battles while they were still prominent in the game, but I definitely understand the fatigue of fighting too many in every campaign as well. It's also really, really nice to be able to capture your starting province without having to fight settlement battle after settlement battle after settlement battle after settlement. You know, you get the picture when it's when it's like three spearmen and three crossbowmen and you don't want to, like having to do a settlement battle can be just tedious. So yeah, I, I really like the way that they went for it. Um, there's some other AI changes that they talked about as well where the AI should be more likely to build this garrison building, especially as we get into the later game. So we should still see settlement battles be relevant. It should give the AI more chances to build better defenses later into the game. So I think that it, I think that it's going to work out great. It's working out so great so far in my experience. Now the next big change that I want to talk about is AI aggression and game difficulty. This is of course a massive and broad category and until we've had some additional weeks to play it and test things out, I think it'll be hard to say anything too definitive. Everybody's going to have anecdotal evidence from one or two campaigns, you know, with the exception of people who are streaming at full time. That's not me though. It's probably not you either so i think we kind of have to hold off on making too many judgments but i really like the sound of things so far and with that being said so far i th believe i've noticed some of these changes in my own campaigns already it says that ai are more likely to attack the tweaks for ai behaviors around settlements so far i found this to be true i've definitely had the ai take losing fights against my garrisons once or twice and in generally they seem a little bit more aggressive or at least willing to make moves into my territory instead of just waiting me out. And that is playing on Legendary Campaign, Very Hard Battle. There's also the additional difficulty scaling for aggressiveness on those higher difficulties. It's tough to say exactly what that means, um, but I think it's something, again, to get a feel for over multiple campaigns. 
This does, however, go hand in hand with the increased faction potential for higher difficulties. If you don't know what faction potential is, uh, look up Venris. Uh, he did a video called um, AI Cheats in Warhammer 3 from a long time ago. I think some of the information needs a little bit of correcting or might be slightly outdated. I don't want to explain the system too in depth, but it's basically the, what determines, it's a, it's a value that scales off of your strength in part that determines the bonuses that AI get and their success in things like auto resolve. So it gives them different advantages and different bonuses. Increasing the faction potential bonus on higher difficulties means that the AI should be able to better retain momentum and should get off to better starts. I, I think that this is a big factor in why late game becomes so stagnant because the scaling just isn't, like the scaling of faction potential just isn't keeping up with the player scaling and so that's what makes them unable to compete with you or participate in the campaign. I think it would have been pretty crazy to bring that system directly into Immortal Empires without you know, testing or rebalancing it, but we definitely went way on the softer side of not having any threats at all. So I'm very glad to see this change. There's also some notes about increases to AI experience gain, better choices and uses of buildings and research and different things like that. Um, so again, I think that it'll just help them to stay more competitive with, you know, even skilled players who are able to take things pretty well. Overall, I'm hoping this will lead to a lot more fun, more dynamic, and more interesting campaigns. I do already feel like, from the campaigns I've played, I'm seeing factions able to gain and retain momentum more often. But again, it is probably still too early to say anything for sure. There's one more general change that I want to talk about before moving on to specific faction changes. I'm still seeing people talking about struggling with confederations, and I've also found them to remain challenging as well. I just want to review the changes here, so hopefully people get a little bit better of an idea of how to approach confederations in the game. As they say, the base aversion has been reduced slightly, the waiting for a player's military strength has been increased slightly, so the, the stronger the imbalance of military strength between the two factions, the more likely they are to confederate. And you'll gain a bonus to confederation if you own regions within the currently active region hint group. This active region hint group is something they talk about in other places in the patch notes. Basically, it just means like what is the general region that the AI is focused on conquering or obtaining and or like working towards. So a faction that's kind of far away from you that's doing something different than what you're doing seems less likely to confederate than if you kind of swoop in and save them. It also mentions the penalty to confederation from the target having recently conquered a settlement now only applies for seven turns down from ten. I'm not sure that's something I even realized. I definitely haven't caught anybody talk about it. Not to say that people haven't, but I didn't. I just haven't watched enough videos to find it. But basically, if the AI is, even if they're doing horribly, if they manage to take a settlement here or there, it actually does give you some sort of a penalty, making it harder to confederate them if it seems like they're not getting absolutely decimated. So that's good to know. And it's like seven turns still kind of seems like a lot like they you a faction could die in seven turns after having taken a settlement that they shouldn't have taken but regardless like i said hopefully this gives people some better a better understanding of how confederations work and what they can do with it with that being said it's time to move on to the race specific highlights i'm sure they will be much more brief and if there's specific ones that you're interested in just hop to that chapter in the video first up is my current mainstay race the Dwarfs, my original favorite from the first game, and I'm so happy to have them back for game three. Their change list is pretty short, but it is very important as well. They've finally gone and fixed the severity scaling of grudges. Yay! Woo! Oh, now I've you know I've made a video about this specifically. It wasn't really holding me back too heavily in my campaigns, but obviously this it was a it was a problem. Like it was something that's not working correctly. I'm really happy to have seen it changed. You still can't forget about your grudges forever, but it takes a lot of unnecessary pressure and, and just bad feelings off of the campaign. Then there's a couple of other small tweaks, like the starting engineers getting some unique traits. And then Belagar has had some changes to his faction and his lord trait. The Vanguard deployment benefit that it talks about in the patch notes is specifically for underway battles that will now apply to his whole faction. And then his army just gets an extra 20% missile block chance. I don't really know where that came from, but it is pretty cool, so I'm not going to argue with it. Uh, it makes an already powerful missile-focused army like the Dwarves less vulnerable to counter-pressure from factions like the Skaven or the Vampire Coast, who might be bringing things like handgunners, rattling guns, warplock, jezails, etc., giving you a little bit better of a chance to block stuff like that and survive. 
Up next is The Empire, another favorite of mine from Game 1, and of course many, many other people's favorites still to this day. They actually got a few more specific tweaks as well as a couple of general ones, so let's take a look. There's more changes to the Elector Count system to be had first. Empire factions are now subject to the five turn delay on Confederations, just like anyone else. We can now also invite Elector Counts to join wars. Really a nice change given the other diplomatic restrictions that seem to exist when it comes to the Elector Count system. They also changed how the special reinforcement events work a little bit too. As you can see, it reduced the reinforcement delay and cost removing the point. So when you get one of those events where you can, you know, buy a mercenary army or spend prestige to send support uh, for an empire army under attack, they added cavalry to it so you can move faster. You can put the reinforcement point anywhere on the map so that you can actually enter the battle and assist them more directly instead of having to, you know, run around or hope that they survive long enough. And you'll also just get on the field faster no matter where you put it. There's also been a change to the authority aspect of the Elector Count system. Uh, while the death of the Elector Count is still something to avoid, the loss of their capital settlement now specifically is as well. The change specifically is that anytime an Elector Count capital is not controlled by them, you lose an, a point of authority. As they say here in the patch notes, and I mean it says you would receive, but I think they mean you would lose. Oh yeah, you would receive a penalty, right? You would lose an Imperial Authority point if the capital was raised, but not when they were occupied. So that means that certain factions could occupy an Elector Count capital, and you actually wouldn't get penalized for that, but you would if they destroyed it. So they reworked it to ensure that any time a capital is controlled by someone other than an Elector Count, you will lose authority for that. And since that would now include Sylvania, where previously it didn't because Sylvania didn't take it, they start with it. So they've changed the buffer for that. Just a little bit of a tweak there. This means that authority can be reclaimed by returning their capital, um, but the loss and gain for their death or revival is there as well. So it's kind of two separate systems that work together. Now, those are the more general changes to the Empire, but there are still some pretty important tweaks to individual factions as well. Reichland now has some buildings in Altdorf reworked and gets a mage on turn two. A big complaint that many people had is that there was no access to mages because only the landmark mage building existed. However, they've changed this to essentially now it replicates just a standard mage tower, but it shows up as a landmark building. Giving us the mage as well seems pretty strong and perhaps unnecessary. Um, some of my friends have told me that you used to get that in Warhammer 2, you would just get a mage on turn 2. I don't remember that for sure, but the people's complaint was you couldn't acquire a mage manually by making the building because it was tier 4. Well, now that issue has been resolved. Also, getting the mage seems kind of strong on top of that, but I suppose I can't complain since their campaign is a little more difficult as well. They also added back the walls building to Altdorf, so now we have that. You can build a garrison like the walls building there and get some more troops in there and upgrade the towers. And they also lowered the unlock of the landmark building for Reichsguard that exists in the capital, so you can get those as tier 3 as well. It's pretty interesting. There's a couple other tweaks to Reichland that I think are worth checking out here, um, but I don't really want to get too into them myself. I might put them in a campaign guide or something like that if I think they're useful, but I, I recommend that you take a look at them if that's of interest to you. The other big change is for uh, Marcus Wolfhart of Wolfhart's Expedition and their faction. I have to say I haven't played them prior to this patch, so I don't know exactly what was wrong with their long victory conditions, but many factions in Game 3 have something similar to this that's been rectified with this patch, where their long victory objective was just, you know, some general objective for them to take. Yeah, I mean, I'd assume that it's the same as what Reichland still is, where you're kind of trying to take over the Empire. You know, a lot of long victory conditions were matching across all factions, but now they've changed that so that there's more variety. So fixing that for uh, Marcus Wolfhart should be kind of nice. Uh, but then we also see that they made a change to the hostility mechanic so that armies will only spawn from certain locations in Lustria. And they also note that if you have an ally that occupies those regions, that it won't count either. So I, I think that's a pretty drastic change. You know, it used to be that those armies would just keep coming, but now theoretically between you and an ally or two, if you have control of enough territory, you might just be able to stop the, you know, the hostility armies from spawning altogether. I know that's a, you know, a feature that people aren't always too super fond of is the hostility mechanic and the armies that come with it. So they've actually come up with a pretty clever solution to that. Now the Lizardmen are up next, and I have to say I'm really hoping that we're looking at some sort of more significant rework for them in the future, given the crumbs that they've gotten so far. You know, we've had some movements and relocations of them. We've, we do, we have had some interesting rebalancing and changes for the individual factions for the release of Immortal Empires, but we still don't have any improvements to the Geomantic Web. I think overall, they're, as a race, their race mechanics are kind of lacking, so I'm hoping we'll see some kind of update to that in the near future. 
here. Um, but for now, we still get a couple more changes to them. Uh, they did fix a lot of the like long victory campaign objectives, similar to Wolfhearts Expedition, like I mentioned. So Krokgar and Nakai have much more suitable victory conditions, which are more relevant to their starting locations. Um, like I said before, you know, the original approach to long victory was kind of give, you know, everybody individual short victories, but have their long victories match up. Well, you know, if you don't start in Lustria, a lot of that stuff doesn't really make sense, especially for Krokgar and Nakai to have to go back there. Um, same kind of thing with Oxyadl, where his conditions have been changed a little bit, tweaked as well. And I think that it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, especially the short victory going down to being six and the long victory is 25. You know, it's a little bit more thematic. It's, it's maybe not that deep of a long victory objective it's kind of simple but it's still something maybe a little bit better than yeah targeting lustria um but it's also interesting to note if you've seen any of the posts on reddit on like turn 13 or whatever or whenever you get that first set of uh visions you could get basically a doom stack of keeper of secrets for slanesh that would spawn and there's no way that you were taking that down unless i mean in most cases, it wasn't going to happen. I don't know if there's any cases that it really would happen. Maybe you send that saving your disaster battle to Legend of Total War or something, but that shouldn't be an issue anymore. They should be appropriately scaled um, for the early game visions of the old ones. The High Elves are a race that I haven't been back to in quite a while now, but they were and still are another one of my favorites. Uh, they're incredibly powerful on both the campaign and map and battlefield, and Game 3 has been quite fine to them. I still think they're a very strong, very well-rounded faction, and they're definitely the faction I would recommend to first-time players for Immortal Empires. Uh, we do see a couple of good fixes for them to start. The quest items getting granted rather than disappearing is really nice. You know, previously you would have these like, I'll occupy this settlement or, you know, win these battles or whatever. And when those things would fall apart, the missions would just abort and you'd be locked out of getting your unique items forever. Seems like, you know, kind of a band-aid fix to just give them to you, but at least that's a change, hopefully for the better. I mean, it, at least you have the option now. Alithanar got a new start location as promised. But if we look at the map, he really hasn't moved far. I suppose it opens up Karen Carr, if only temporarily in the early game. I think it does give him a little more flexibility with where to go at the start of the, his campaign, but in the end I really don't think it'll change that much. Now Tharian the Grim is yet another person who's benefited from the change in the you know long victory conditions. Rather than having to focus on Ulthuan, they've had him focus on taking proper control of the Badlands and the mountains across, um, but also having to secure the area near Estalia and Tilia, as well as taking down Grom the Paunch. It's actually kind of cool. It means your goal is to secure a more direct connection between your expedition and Ulthuan, so it's, I think it's kind of interesting. Imric is yet another lord that's seen victory condition changes. Uh, I really like these, as I feel like his is kind of one of the worst ones for trying to take over Ulthuan and migrate back there. It really felt like it sort of pigeonholes you into going back there, and uh, I don't know that, you know, from where you start, that doesn't really seem like, you know, at least what I would want to do. Now you can focus a lot more on your starting region and have a lot more freedom to choose where to go from there. Going southwest to the desert could be fun, or maybe even trying to skirt around to Cathay using the sea lanes could make for some fun times. You could potentially even reach to the Dark Elf homelands without too much effort if you were to go that route as well. Now Teclis got himself a new start location and victory condition tweaks, although I have to say I don't think I'm actually a huge fan of either one. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm still happy to have the change up from, you know, another Althuan takeover for the High Elves as the long victory, um, but having played Teclis' campaign before, I feel a little strange about the start position change. He's basically replaced Kairos' position and then pushed Kairos further down south. I would still end up wanting to take out Kairos early on, but it would be a lot less rewarding to do so now. Though it is easier to move through and capture your starting province than it was previously, I suppose. Uh, if we look at his victory conditions, though, the, the whole elven colonies thing is kind of strange. You really have to travel and explore a fair bit to achieve this. Uh, either that or you reveal the map with your technology and then you try to ally any elves or whoever is potentially there. You're just going to have to reach pretty far in several different directions, and I'm not sure if this is actually better than the previous victory conditions it's just different so you can see i kind of went through them and they're all over the place so i, I don't know if that's it's, it's different it's interesting but it, is it going to be good or fun do i want to play for that long victory condition i don't really know now Kislev is a race i haven't played too much of i did like them in the realms of chaos and i'm glad they're in the game um, but i think really all the previous races i covered will still be my favorites over Kislev. 
Uh, it doesn't help that their campaign is really tough and they have some other issues going on as well, which I'm not sure if they're resolved here. Hopefully some are fixed. Uh, it does say Ice Core enemies, that like starting enemies armies, have been weakened a bit, which should help their early game momentum. And they also get the Ice Sculpting tech unlocked. Of course, that's only for the Ice Court, so who knows if Kostaltan's campaign in Immortal Empires is still pretty brutal, I'm sure. Uh, they also did make a pretty big change that the Kislev technology is requiring ownership of settlements. So those those three like main capital cities for Kislev, now you don't have to own them directly. It's possible for your ally to own them in order to unlock those technologies that were previously locked. That's a big benefit, I think, mostly for Boris. But uh, it's still it's still something that they definitely needed to put in the game. I think that makes a big difference. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about is this campaign settlement visuals for the Southern Oblast region. I'm just going to pull this map back up. I don't think I need to load into the campaign. Hopefully you kind of recognize some of this territory. We've got Kislev starting in the River Uskov, and Southern Oblast is kind of the territory you'd start out with. This is an issue that existed previously, but I don't think the issue is the visuals. It's that since Norskans start in Southern Oblast, these territories classified as Norskan territories, and thus any buildings, building defenses there wouldn't give you walls. Now they've changed the settlement slash field battle stuff. Um, so maybe it doesn't matter anymore and you would just be able to get unwalled settlements. But I'm I'm hoping that what this means is it's not just the visuals that have changed, but that it's also the technical classification of the territories as well. It's not certain to me how this has worked. And frankly, I don't have time to test it yet. But theoretically, I'm hoping that in addition to the visuals, it means that these are technically Kislev territories. So you can actually build the garrison building and get, you know, functional instead of it being like Norskan territory defenses where you don't get, you know, the upgrade to the battle type. Now that it's Kislev territory types, you do get the upgrade to the battle type. At least that's what I'm hoping. Cathay actually had quite a big change, uh, a big nerf to their harmony mechanic in regards to buildings. I suppose we could consider it a bug or an unintended behavior, uh, but previously you used to be able to go into this building menu and select the alternative harmony version of the same type of building. You could simply transfer this building type over into that other type. Now it seems you can't do this at all. It at least didn't work on the few buildings that I've tried. Uh, it's tough because this used to be a very effective way to manage harmony properly. Now, whenever you're taking new territory, you're going to have to destroy buildings and remake them. Uh, it seems like it's going to be some extra work to manage, and I, I don't think that that's going to be very fun. I don't know if that's a good change. There are also some other minor bug fixes as shown, namely the casting of spells in dragon form, which works now the same now as it did before Immortal Empires. I didn't even realize that in Immortal Empires you could take dragon form and still cast all your spells. Uh, it was originally limited to these when you were in Realms of Chaos campaign, so for all you Cathay players out there, I'm sure you had a fun time, but we're back to normal there now. Um, and then the compass ability not correctly causing attrition. Seems like they fixed that, so anything beyond the wall of Cathay should take attrition when you activate that now. So just a couple little fixes there. Now, I said I wanted to look at the Skaven notes. I really do. This video is already starting to get pretty long, and I, I frankly just I don't have the time or the experience with it so far. I've seen or have played enough of some of these other factions so far to at least be able to comment on it. I don't feel confident commenting on some of these changes. It sounds like they got some good reworks to throw and to Queek, trying to make them a little more interesting. A lot of those changes we saw for other factions, you know, on the release of Immortal Empires, we're getting some more of those kinds of updates now uh, in patch 2.2 for Skaven. Um, they also fixed some bugs, like I didn't even know that you used to be able to, where is it? Warlock Engineer's 10 turn cooldown. You used to be able to just establish an undercity every turn, which must have been absolutely crazy. Uh, but of course it didn't work that way before, so we're kind of looking looking like things are more like normal. Some bug fixes and stuff like this, but definitely some new mechanics and trying to, you know, the rework of the betrayal bonus for Treacherous Faction, which might make him actually a little bit more fun and interesting to play instead of, you know, trying to get attacked and then retreating and have weird stuff going on there. They also made the mass changes to the Doom Wheel like they talked about so that they have a better chance, you know, they're more effective as like a chariot type unit and can push through enemy units. Um, but other than that, I, I can't say that I've had enough experience on them so far to really comment on these changes in depth yet. But it's really nice that they're taking a look at, at different mechanics for all sorts of different factions and trying to make them interesting. So with that being said, 
I think that covers everything I wanted to for this video. There's a lot of big changes that kind of apply globally to this game that I really wanted to cover. There's a lot of important ones, especially things that people have been waiting for for a while. Uh, there's definitely still some room to grow on things like Confederation and stuff like that, and I'm sure we still have plenty of bug fixes for things that aren't working properly, as well as other changes to you know, like I said, with the High Elves, it's kind of a band-aid fix to just give you the quest items if something goes wrong, like if the quest gets aborted. Hopefully we can find some alternative ways to complete those quests instead of just, you know, having it be a do or die sort of option. Uh, I'd really like in the future for them to continue adding mechanics, like a, the, the lizard men still need some kind of racial overhaul. I'm really hoping that that comes sometime soon. And uh, I've also heard things about... Like, there's a bug in the Empire campaigns right now, where sometimes the Elector Count events just don't trigger correctly. Uh, you might have to download a mod or run some console commands to force some to happen, and then that seems to kind of get things back on track. But they, they just released a hotfix today as of the time of recording this as well, and so I'm, but they didn't fix that Empire issue. So we definitely still, there's still some cleanup that's left to be done. Um, make sure if you run, run into any of these bugs, post them on the official uh, feedback support sections. If we go down to the end here, the looking forward section, right? This is where you're going to want to go. It, you know, if you go to the totalwar.com slash blog, you can find the patch 2.2 update notes. If you don't know how to get to these websites here, you can see down in the bottom left, it's on the forums that you can go to or on the Steam community for feedback or bug reports. They have sections for that. Definitely make your voice known. They'll check Reddit, but you should just report the thing directly to them anyway, or check if it's a known issue already because the Empire one, in fact, is. But with that being said, I hope that you learned some valuable things here. I hope that, you know, my analysis or feedback of this kind of gave you some more interesting things to think about. I'm really excited that they have started to hit what I consider a pretty good stride of pushing out updates, of fixing things. There's a lot of work to be done so far, um, but it's I'm really glad that they have kind of an open mind at looking at making these sort of tweaks. The settlement battle frequency changes, I think that's a really big deal. Um, even looking at things like tweaking confederation is useful, So and moving legendary lords starting positions, uh, that's, that's new aside from having to create an entire new game for them to do that. So it's, it's really cool that they're looking towards these sorts of things to make the games and campaigns fun and interesting, changing victory conditions, changing bonuses, and updating legendary lords and their factions. It's all really good stuff. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful. If you have any other questions on my thoughts on this patch or anything else in general, please leave them in the comments section below. If there's some highlights that I missed that you wish I would have talked about or you want to share with the community, please leave those in the comments section as well. And as always, thanks for watching. Have a great day. And we'll see you on the next one.